Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Fern Freud, who comes to us all the way from Southern England. Fern is what I would consider an outsider, and that's an increasingly rare breed of human who spends more time out of doors than indoors. Fern developed her skills as a mushroom forager early in life in some intriguing familial circumstances, and she has since become a prolific plant forager as well. Fern shares her foraging talents both on social media and in her community, leading groups into the woods, sharing an appreciation of nature's abundance, and doing her part to turn the tide against Britain's entrenched mycophobia. Not afraid to dabble in the realm of the Green Witch, she's immersed in folklore and folk tales, which seem to go hand in hand with an appreciation of the mysterious kingdom fungi. Fern, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here. I'm glad we were able to connect here over the Atlantic and navigate time differences and technology and mm, everything else. The amazing else. world we live in. Exactly. Well, um, usually where I'll start with a lot of my guests is mm -hmm. kind of their origin story and how they got into foraging. And for you, uh, I learned that that's kind of even <laughs> more interesting than I had initially thought. So just to get it out of the way, I don't want to make the whole podcast about this, but your last name is Freud. And there is yeah. not a quit. I mean, you have a relation to the Freud that everyone knows. Yes, I do. So he's a great, great granddad, I think. Um, so yeah, not, not a big part of my life really but everyone everyone's always it's the first question people ask like oh are you related <laughs> it, so, yeah it isn't it isn't mandatory reading in the family do we all need to read Sigmund's work and we, or or were you familiar with it just by being raised in that environment um I think it sort of comes up around the table you know like occasionally everyone does have a kind of common interest in like art and psychology definitely um but yeah you you know it's not like an initiation right where you have to have read <laughs> You're right. or you have to works of Sigmund Freud to be allowed at the dinner table <laughs> right or a coming of age ceremony you have to psychoanalyze someone in the family or something <laughs> there is a lot of psychoanalyzing going on I can imagine I can imagine you guys yeah. know like way too much about how the brain works it makes it hard yes, to have any uh, kind of argument it makes for a weird growing up <laughs> like if you've ever got any problems like what's the real problem here? right like, right oh, nothing. we're not staying surface level here uh well yeah. and it was interesting to learn too how you started foraging because that's you know that's how i discovered you i think that's your biggest kind of uh foray into the mushroom world as it were uh is mm -hmm. mushroom foraging and then how did that start you said it started when you were really young yeah so um my dad's always had a massive um interest in mushrooms um generally of the uh, psychoactive variety so we were kind of out in the fields from quite a young age um and yeah that was just sort of our like weekend activity we'd go out we'd pick mushrooms i think really dad just needed a bit of a workforce to collect as as many as he could um so we kind of got introduced to it that way um and then it just became like a really lovely family hobby and um yeah, me and my brother wanted to learn what everything else was, so we sort of expanded out the mushrooms. Um, but yeah, it's kind of it. It has that real um, oh, what do you call it? Well, I've always I've it's always been envious. I've always mm. been envious of people that started as children that kind of got yeah. introduced to foraging early on, because mm -hmm. I think foraging has given me so many things that the one thing I wish is, man, I wish I had started this sooner. Uh, because it mm. does give you so many benefits outside of, you know, just the goodies that you find. Uh, another yeah, thing that popped sure. into my head in getting ready to interview you, you know, England mm -hmm. is kind of this land of folk tales and things like that, at least it, in terms of American culture. That's kind of some of my mythos around England is kind of the origin of a lot of folk tales and fairy stories. And in yeah. doing my research, I was kind of bringing up some old stories, including the story of Easter, not to sidetrack us too much, but the story of Easter <laughs> is actually that adults were looking for Amanita muscaria and other brightly colored, potentially uh, psychoactive or deliriant or some kind of, you know, physiological mm. mind, uh, mind changing mushrooms. And mm -hmm. they would recruit the kids to go out and find these bright little mushrooms and they would mm -hmm. teach them to find bright Easter eggs. 
and we kind of trained them with different Easter egg hunts. And, <laughs> and, you know, that was the time of year when the mushrooms would yeah, start popping yeah. out and kids were just better at finding them. So recruiting kids into the workforce to find psychoactive mushrooms to me, it seems mm -hmm. like it has a proud tradition. Yeah, I think dad, dad very proudly carried it on. And uh, that's what kids are good for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gives it gives ideas to everyone with kids out there. You've got a little, <laughs> you've got a little foraging workforce on your hands. Um, Do you know what? Kids are always the best ones on all of all, all of my public workshops. Like if we're doing mushroom hunts, it's always the kids that find the best things because they're like they're closer to the ground. Yeah, they can just focus more. I don't know what it is, but they're, they're always the ones that find the, the like great finds. I'm, I'm not surprised. Kids are a little bit closer to source. They seem to be inherently good at a lot of things. Um, now, I do also want to brought, bring up, I brought up my intro a little bit, um, the mm. cultural background of Britain. Uh, you know, Britain is known and America as well, kind of Western Anglican countries are known for a little bit of mycophobia, especially when mm. compared to areas in Asia, even areas in Eastern Europe. So... Mm -hmm. How did that kind of affect your introduction into mushrooms? Obviously, as a family, you guys had, you know, a lot of influences pushing you to go forage for mushrooms. But did the influence of Britain's kind of mycophobic culture play any role in those early days learning about foraging? Well, I think probably when I was a kid, it wasn't a common thing to do at all. Um, you know, there, there is a lot of fear around collecting mushrooms in England. Um, and you know you you don't you don't have that kind of uh, you wouldn't ever bump into like another mushroom forager or it would be really rare um so it kind of a lot of people come up to you and say like oh what's in your basket and what are you doing and you know there is a lot of curiosity about it because just you know as people whatever scares us we're very very curious about um so it kind of made it a bit of a a, a social talking point really like we, we met a lot of people and I guess it sort of became a niche for me because it was such a like odd thing to be doing. Um, so yeah, so in a way I, I did kind of benefit from the, the ingrained fear of mushrooms in England. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's not such a bad thing really. Uh, that so many people come to my courses because they've got really outdoorsy kids who are always picking things up and you know really curious about what's around them and, and they're worried because of this ingrained culture and they want to learn more so yeah I think I'm sneakily benefiting from the uh microphobia there <laughs> I was gonna say it's actually making kind of a a greater role for you to play as kind of the bringer mm. of this knowledge to a society that may not be as aware you know whether willfully or otherwise just not as into mushrooms so you get to have yeah. kind of a more of a prominent role uh, in bringing this to people, more of kind of a specialized role. Yeah, I'm definitely role lucky in that way. I feel like if I went to like Poland or Russia, uh, you know, they'd be like, what? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, they'd be like, are you sure you're an expert on mushrooms? Because we've been doing this. <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, we know more. <laughs> and you probably have more competition uh, for mushrooms. I was going to say it's another sneaky benefit. Yeah. Is a society that doesn't hunt mushrooms, you know, especially when you think about an island, kind of a limited land mass. Mm -hmm. It's nice to not have too much competition when you're out yeah, in the Yeah, that woods. is true. It's definitely like an increasing hobby now, though. Like I've really noticed, that especially in the last like five years, maybe it's it's becoming a lot more common and there are places now where we've got like uh because i know do you guys have it as well right and in in france i know they have kind of a limitation on how many mushrooms you can bring home or you have like a kilogram limit of well in california we're actually really lucky um it's one of the few as in so far as i know one of the few mm -hmm. states where the state parks it is legal to forage for mushrooms Okay. Um, sometimes it's legal without permit, certain state parks, other places, they say you have to buy a foraging permit, but right. actually the influence of a lot of Eastern European communities and Italian mm -hmm. communities that were some of the early settlers out here, um, yeah. especially in kind of Northern California around San Francisco made it much more, um, there's a bunch bigger cultural push to normalize mm -hmm. mushroom foraging. So whereas okay. it, it was something that they tried to really legislate they did try to kind of legislate it away where you couldn't pick wild mushrooms, but yeah. especially 
just recently, I ran into an Italian gentleman in a hardware store of all places. Okay. And one one of the other employees there actually recognized me from Instagram and said, oh, wow. oh, you have to talk to my coworker. He's an Italian. He loves mushrooms. Anyway, this guy just starts telling me this whole story about how mm. his family was one of this collective of Italian families that went to state legislature and really pushed in politics for a couple generations to make sure that foraging not only was legal, but that they could expand the actual, well, here it's pound limit of what you could take right. out of the forest. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, from where I am, I, I can thank, you know, a lot of these Italian, Eastern European families yeah, yeah. for really- for boosting the limit. <laughs> exactly, for boosting the limit and just making it something that uh, is legislated as being legal. You can go to a state park and pick mushrooms. You know, it's really, <laughs> Uh, it's really something that I don't always appreciate, but hearing that story made me realize, wow, we are in a unique place, not only for the great mushrooms that grow here in Northern California, but that yeah. there have been cultures that have paved the way to make it normalized to an extent where it is legal and there's not, you know, this big stigma or at least illegality. Yeah, that's it. brilliant. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah. So, so we don't have, we don't have the limit at all because it's not, it's not a, um, such a common thing. I, I guess it might be brought in some areas at some point. Um, but here they kind of use the fear of mushrooms to to keep people off land, you know, if, if it's been picked quite a lot or if they have quite a lot of mushroom foragers on, on that area, there's quite often a sign somewhere that says, you know, beware poisonous mushrooms. Um, that's probably how you know you're in a good spot, though. Yeah, um, yeah I was going to say, sometimes that's a yeah. side post for foragers yeah, yeah. to say, oh, not only is there definitely mushrooms here, but people are going to be warned off by this side. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. No one else is going to fight you for them. Come on in. <laughs> so you got to start in mushroom foraging in kind of that British culture where it's a little more unknowns and you had a familial history. You know, they're training you to forage mushrooms. Now you say they had a brother. So I assume he was out foraging, learning with you as well from a young age. Yeah, he did come. He was probably a bit more reluctant. <laughs> He's now a, he's a coder, um, so he's definitely an indoors kind of guy. So I think maybe maybe right. it put him off a bit much. <laughs> so, but you seem to have taken to it and then actually kept going. And obviously now you're leading groups into the woods. We're going to get into that. But what was interesting to me is that you've expanded also, I mean, quite extensively into plant foraging, which... Mm is something I'm quite envious of. I always see people out foraging for wild plants and I wish I yeah. knew more about it or how to do it because then you're not limited to this kind of only mushroom season. You're able to pick things year round. And I mean, there's so many possibilities with plants. One look at your Instagram with some of the things you're cooking, some of the things you're doing with it just makes you want to get into it. So I guess when did, did mushroom foraging kind of start you on this path of overall foraging? Then how did you get into plant foraging? Yeah, I think um, with the mushrooms, we'd sort of take the mushrooms home, we'd like pour them out over the table, um, we'd cook up the edible ones, but it would always be like, oh, we'd do a trip out to the fields and then we'd do a trip to the supermarket and then, you know, and we almost wanted to cut out that trip to the supermarket because we were like, well, I think you can eat nettles. Someone told me you can eat nettles. Like, should we have those instead of spinach or, you know, and we just wanted to um add add different ingredients to our plates without having to go to the shop on the way home and it sort of became a challenge to see you know if we could make first a complete meal out of wild ingredients and then you know maybe can we also make a dessert like is that a possibility um so it just went from there really but I do think I know you want to get into it and I massively think you should because it you know, like you get that feeling like when you get into mushroom hunting, you're like, what, oh, how did I not know this was a thing? Like, this is so great. And then it, the door, right. like another door opens for plant foraging. And, and it's, it's so varied, you know, you've got like berries, nuts, you've got tree saps, you've got wild grasses, seaweeds. Um, and there's, there's just so much to learn about and so many different flavors. And um, you can, you can just be really creative and yeah. I highly recommend it. Well, and one of the, the things that, you know, like mushroom foraging for me was daunting at first. So when you're listing mm -hmm. plant foraging, some of those same things in my mind come up like, oh my God, there's berries and nuts and grass. You know, it's like there's a, yeah. a big universe to explore. The good thing mm -hmm. is 
once you do it a few times and you know, I should know this, I've done mushroom hunting. Once you do it a few times, find these things in the wild, it becomes ingrained. It's not mm -hmm. something that's like a constant battle of, you know, once you do it and go find it, you know, that one, you know, that nut, you know, that berry, yeah. you know, that wild garlic, and you mm -hmm. kind of can build your knowledge base out. It doesn't have to be something that's daunting where you have to, you know, have an yeah. encyclopedic knowledge from the start or constantly remind yourself necessarily. Um, I find that with foraging because it is so tangible and physical, the memory of what things are when you're finding them, especially when you're guided by someone who knows their stuff, really imprints in your memory um, more so than yeah. kind of subject matter where you aren't having that physical aspect of it. I guess it's been something, it's almost like it's not, it doesn't feel like you're learning. It feels like almost like you're remembering you know like it doesn't it doesn't feel like new knowledge all the time like you go for a walk you learn another one or two plants and you come home but that just feels like that knowledge should just be already in existence you know like it's not hard to get someone shows you a plant and somehow you just remember and you can see that plant again in three years and go oh yeah i, I know what that is someone showed me that and you know that's what we're evolved to do is sort of find and hunt for these plants and I think that's why it's just like an innately pleasurable experience because our brains have literally like developed to forage and now we live in this like mad technological world but you know just a couple of hours foraging and you're just like oh it just makes you feel at home it just makes you feel very like at peace and yeah it's a it's a lovely thing to do well and we're tapping into that lineage of ancestral knowledge i mean mm. for the most part we probably are remembering i mean at some point our ancestors probably knew what all of these things in the forest were mm -hmm. and instead you know i have more of a familiarity with the brand names of different shops than i do yeah, with yeah. trees or plants in the forest and you know that's kind yeah. of a sad thing i think mm. there should be a push more to to interface with the natural world and this is a, something big that i preach about is i think as people get more of that cognizance of what's going on in the natural world, more mm -hmm. understanding of the plants and mushrooms that surround them, you get more of an innate appreciation for that world because now you yeah. recognize more about it. And as we face, you know, global issues surrounding the environment, having mm -hmm. more people tuned into an appreciation with nature can only kind of help. I think that's a huge oh, thing. Is yeah. If you're going to expect people to care, you, people have to know about it and really understand it. Um, yeah. So a push to tie in with kind of that ancestral knowledge of what plants and mushrooms are is mm -hmm. really going to be a key to dealing with the modern problems, I think, that we have in our environment just by getting mm -hmm. people to, to care. Yeah, I massively agree. I quite often have people being like, oh, well, how sustainable is foraging? Like, is that, you know, are you doing a good thing for the planet? And it's almost like, well, a world full of foragers is good you know, like they're going to be people that literally have formed a connection and almost like a relationship with these plants. And they, you know, you, you want to keep them safe and you want to know that they're going to be there when you go back again and you want to teach people about them, teach your kids about them. Like they're going to do a lot less damage than, I don't know, the people that want to build huge golf courses or supermarkets or anything. Like it's just, yeah, foraging does make you, just just build that connection with the nature natural world and i think i always think that is a funny thing because people talk about that especially with mushroom foraging you know yeah. if you're picking the mushroom are you killing it are you damaging it are you preventing future generations now i don't want to make blanket statements because i know there are actually some areas of eastern europe where they do have to limit the amount of foraging because at some point pulling mushrooms out of the ground does damage that underlying mycelium and for anyone listening yeah. You're obviously intimately familiar with this, but mushrooms are the fruiting body. The actual living organism is a lattice-like root structure underneath the ground that often spreads in a huge area of this white kind of mycelial mass. And that's really the living organism. The mushrooms are its reproductive fruiting body. So yeah, there are cases where if you pick every single fruiting body and really dig it out of the ground, you may be damaging the underlying mycelium. I get that. I also think that foragers may play a big role in actually propagating mushrooms uh especially if, carrying them around yeah. exactly especially if you have the equipment like a bag with you know um 
or, or so, excuse me, something that's not airtight or something that's not, you know, uh, like a knitted bag or a woven basket or something where those microscopic spores as you're carrying them are actually falling out of your mushrooms mm -hmm. um, and allowing them, the spores to later combine and form new areas of, my, of mycelium. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think it's just so funny that people think, oh, is this sustainable? It's like, really, there are so many problems with sustainability in the world. Where is it? You think it's <laughs> yeah. really the people hunting around the forest for wild mushrooms and wild, wild yeah. plants? Like are somehow... And just as we've evolved to pick them, they've evolved to deal with a land of mammals who pick them, knock them over, kick them. That's just, that's how they're made. They're not evolved to deal with like restructuring, you know, the woodland, but they can survive people picking them up in that's, most cases. That's such a good point. I mean, we have co-evolved now for hundreds of thousands of years with mm -hmm. these plants, these mushrooms. I mean, yes, there has been adaptation on their end too, whether yeah. it's making themselves bright enough to attract our attention so we eat it and spread mm -hmm. their seeds, you know. So, the, yeah, I, I just think that whole conversation around is foraging sustainable. I mean, I think there is a conversation to be had when you get into commercial level foraging. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, that's something we have here where certain, you know, certain areas just get you can see. I mean, the clear cutting, all the pine needles and duff are actually lifted okay. off the forest floor. There'll be huge oh, swaths yeah. of area where bushes are all I mean, people take you know, I imagine kind of machetes and they're just hacking down all mm. the low lying undergrowth, uh, especially mm. for mushrooms like black trumpet, hedgehog, chanterelle that sometimes hide under, you know, huckleberry bushes and things. They're just clear cutting okay. all that out of the way and picking all the mushrooms. Mm. So yeah, that's sad. <laughs> there, there is a conversation around it and maybe it's a good thing that people are thinking about sustainability, but like, let's not be overly critical of the sustainability of something that's getting you out into nature that probably mm -hmm. is actually helping to propagate these wild foods more than anything uh and really like is not the central problem what we're dealing with on the planet um <laughs> so i guess for you when did this love of foraging this passion for kind of ancestral foraging knowledge when did this turn into something you felt comfortable sharing with other people and uh bringing other people out of the woods with you because i'm impressed by the groups that you're leading. And I, I'm always impressed with people who are able to kind of share that knowledge and impart it with others and not be held back by like a fear of, I don't know enough. Or So when did you start feeling comfortable enough? Um, so I guess, so I ran my first workshop only, I think two years ago um, as kind of a tester, but I'd been putting out all of my, you know, taking pictures of what I was doing, putting out pictures of, um, my meals that I'd made and the things that I'd foraged out on um, Instagram and Facebook and people a lot of people asking like oh what's this can I come with you and it got to a point where sort of every time I went out for a forage I'd have like three people and their kids and their dog and uh, I was sort of like okay well obviously people are really interested in this like I'm really enjoying sharing it uh, you know maybe this could maybe I could do a workshop or, or you know, try and make this a, a business in some way. Um, so I, I did not feel ready for my first one at all. I sort of threw myself in at the deep end. I sort of nervously walked around some field and some woodland clutching like little uh, cards that I'd squeezed loads and loads of writing on. Um, and But it was really good. I loved it. And um, just the the sense of community that it made you know I took everyone for maybe like a two and a half hour guided foraging walk and then we all sat down and um, cooked up some of the food over a campfire and it just yeah just felt really great and like it's you know what I should be doing um, and it went from there really. Well and I think that's a big thing that I always encourage people to do you know I get a lot of questions about how do I learn about foraging I want to know what you know I want to read a book, you know, what website can I go to? And those things are great. I think the reference materials we have now, you know, I'm, I was speaking with some foragers kind of from an older generation who didn't have a plethora of mushroom identification books, didn't have mm -hmm. the internet even, didn't have a plethora of websites. Uh, and while there's still, you know, some conflicting information, it's still kind of an oral tradition. Uh, I think there's a lot of value to those reference materials, but there is nothing like going in person with someone who knows your area, uh, and really experiencing it in a physical way where someone is showing you, you can feel the mushroom, you know, they're able to point out common misconceptions or why something in this area might be different 
with a certain mushroom versus another area where it grows. You know, there's mm -hmm. something about connecting with that community in person when it comes to foraging that yeah. I think imparts it on like a cellular level. And uh -huh. yeah, definitely. I, I don't know about you, but that's really the workshops you're describing are kind of how I started and how I learned. Um, yeah. You know, I could read all the books in the world and maybe it's the type of person that I am, but I could read all the books in the world and read the websites. And it's almost like information overload. Like, no, I need someone to walk through with me in my mm -hmm. area and really show me. And then I'll know. And I'll know in that place of, like you said, like remembering, like I'll know it and it'll kind of like reactivate some old knowledge of my ancestors maybe. And I'll know it moving forward. I won't have to, you know, it'll be embedded. So is, is that how you learn to? Yeah, absolutely. I think even now, you know, I've, I've been foraging for a really long time, but if I see a new herb or a new plant or a new mushroom in a book, I would not trust myself at all to then go out, no matter how much I'd researched it and pick that up and be like, this is this. Like for sure, I think the best way to learn about wild plants, wild mushrooms is to have someone show you in real life because yeah, it's little things, it's the texture, it's where it's growing, it's what trees it's under, it's, you know, the 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 shade of the cap that you can't quite get you know the way the sunlight bounces off it just tiny little details that you don't even realize that you're registering in real life that you'd miss out on over the internet or in books so i definitely think it, yeah it's a kind of irl activity definitely and i think <laughs> you know there's something about books and information that is not region specific so you mm -hmm. know when i first started i would I think everyone starts just walking around the forest, picking up mushrooms, and you try to identify them. And I would come yeah. up with these IDs and share them with people. And they'd be like, you know, that mushroom doesn't actually grow in the Western United States. So, you know, <laughs> there's something about doing it with people that give you kind of that knowledge of like almost limiting that universe of all the information to no, no, here's what's relevant to you, here where you yeah, live. Yeah, like whittling it down. Yeah. And so even when, you know, I want to go forage, like I'm originally from the East Coast of the United States. Okay. Uh, and so I've had my experience out in the West Coast. I have contacted, you know, people back east who are foragers. So if I'm ever going back, visiting home mm -hmm. or visiting family, um, I would probably have them take me out because that's a different region. That's yeah. not like, I, yeah, I've learned a lot about the West Coast. Obviously, there are mushrooms that are similar, but I want to go with someone from that area. And I believe mm -hmm. that's a really important thing, understanding kind of the the regionality of this. Uh, and understanding that in person, you're going to just learn and retain so much more. Yeah, now, it's the experience as well, I think, you know, like you create that memory and it links to the plant and, and you're kind of going to remember those in a, in a couple, in a pair. And if, you know, it's a lovely experience being sat at home and reading a book, but there's it's not going to match. It's not going to stick in your head as much as meeting up with an old friend and taking a walk through the woods and and finding something magic. That's that's a great point. The memories you form are probably a really key part, mm -hmm. you know, is the memory of the forage that helps you remember, oh, yeah, and that's that kind of mushroom. Um, mm -hmm. So for you, what kind of people, and I think you alluded to this, some um, people with outdoorsy kids, but what kind of people are, uh, are you find joining your forages? Um, so generally, I think it's people that are already quite outdoorsy or you know, they enjoy being outdoors. In England, we kind of have this thing like going for a walk is just like walking your dog. So everyone will kind of do like a little short walk around the woods with their dog and that's going for a walk. And yeah. I think it's people who want to expand into like actually going for a walk, like really experiencing being out in nature um, and kind of, yeah, just adding to their, adding to their experience of being outdoors really. And I think it's it's people who are looking for a bit more of a hobby or a bit more of a reason to be outside it's lovely to go for a walk but when you're foraging it's you know it's like an activity that you're learning and you can expand on and progress with um so yeah really all different types of people but outdoorsy people really well and that's really something that in the era of you know decreasing attention spans and the era of so much going on i know like for me personally it was hard for me to, to go out and you know go take it yeah for me, taking a walk was going around the 
the block with my dog. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And that's not really getting you out into nature to a point where you get some of those regenerative effects, you know, mm -hmm. i.e. kind of like a forest bathing. But when you get out in nature, everyone knows there are regenerative effects that happen mentally, physically, emotionally. But it's hard to really set aside time for, you know, three hours of like just walking a trail. Um, that said, mm -hmm. there are plenty of people that do it, plenty of people that love hiking. And I totally yeah. get it. But that's almost like an outdoorsy lifestyle. And for someone like me, who is kind of a more traditional, almost like corporate lifestyle where you're working a nine mm -hmm. to five job and then you get home, you start, you know, it's hard to find that time to get out and like, really, I'm going to go walk in the woods for three to four hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when you have some incentive like, hey, you're going to find something, you might be able to eat it, you know, you yeah. might be able to or, you know, you'll connect with this community and we'll all learn about the forest together and realize the treasures you find out there that incentivizes it to a point where it makes it so much easier to spend a lot of time outdoors. That yeah, was, for sure. And I'm just speaking from personal experience. That was key for me. And it's given me so much just spending more time outdoors, balancing out all of our screen time and all of our time, like in busy cities and all the low level stress that that imparts, yeah. finding more reason to get out and be in nature, even if that's like tapping into, you know, dopamine, all the things we're wired with that, <laughs> that love foraging. Um, <laughs> You know, I think that has such a huge benefit. I think it's such a useful tool to to just do that, to get people outside. Mm. Yeah, it's almost like using foraging as a tool just to, just to be outside, like just to be able to get that like clarity and space in your mind. And almost, I feel like when you're just going for a walk, you still hold quite a lot of stress in your mind. Like, you know, you can just think about things over and over and, but but if you have the activity or if you have something that you're focusing on, it makes it easier just to feel a bit, you know, more more grounded, I guess. And more present, right? That's more a big present, thing. Yeah. Is trying to be present, trying to, yeah, let those stresses kind of go to the back of your mind. And mm. if you're hunting for an edible mushroom you've never found, let me tell you, that will have you being present. You will suddenly <laughs> be looking at the forest floor with such interest, everything else in your life will evaporate away. Yes, true. Now, do you have any, I, I had it written down here, any stories or anything that you share about um, just particularly impactful or memorable stories from some of your forages? Um, yeah, I guess there's been quite a few stories. The best ones always involve kids. I'm good. Okay, which one's my favorite? Okay, so I think a lot of times kids come to the workshops or the walks and they don't really know what they're going to be doing or or what's going to be happening. Um, and generally, I find parents will take their children to my workshops because they're like, they've got so much energy. I don't know what else to do with them. Like, they always want to be outside. They're just running around I really don't you know I maybe this will be good for them like it's something different and um and we had one young boy I think he was probably I guess he was about 11 or 12 and his dad had bought him and he was like oh you know to be honest he's a bit of a nightmare sorry if he acts up he's you know he's got so much energy if he doesn't listen like he's not very good at school so just you know don't take it personally you just let him run off you know he'll be fine he'll come back and I was like Perfect. oh okay um yeah that's absolutely fine like it's not school he can he can do what he likes no worries and um it was a mushroom hunt and we'd been a bit we hadn't really found too much it, it was a bit of a it was coming towards the end of the season so we hadn't found like a really good amount of, of mushrooms to feed our little tribe and um, I'd seen him kind of taking interest, you know, kind of coolly hanging around the back of the group, like shuffling his feet, like trying to look like he wasn't listening. And then um, one of the mushrooms I kind of knew would be growing in that area, it was like uh, oyster mushrooms. And I sort of described what they looked like and when they might find them and blah, blah, blah. And said, you know, it's not just on the ground you should be looking, you know, look up, look at tree trunks, look, you know, look all around you. And at one point, I just heard him shout like, I found an oyster mushroom. And I turned around and he was scaling like the biggest tree I've ever seen in my life. That's and amazing. then kind of wrestling this huge oyster mushroom, which is enough to feed like 30 people. 
Um, wow. And that, yeah, it was mad and kind of crawled down. And it was like a real, you could just tell, like it was a real moment of achievement for him. And everyone was kind of like cheering and congratulating him. And he was kind of like the man of the, the man of the hour. Um, so that was a really nice one, I think, just because it was it's it was obviously so different from his normal life and he just absolutely thrived and and loved it and it was it was just lovely to be a part of yeah well and i think there are a lot of kids like that that don't necessarily thrive in a super structured mm. school environment or you know some of the modern environments that we throw kids into there isn't enough to stimulate them you know mentally and physically so yeah, yeah something like foraging clearly he was actually listening but something like he foraging was. when he gets a little foundation can become this immensely rewarding activity for kids because mm -hmm. it does stimulate i mean intellectually you have to remember be able to identify mm -hmm. uh, be able to look at the right habits and then physically, you know, maybe not climbing the biggest tree, but physically you're having to, <laughs> to go around and collect them and figure. And so I think that's a really potent story in illustrating that, that, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's it's not school, but maybe it should be part of school. You know, maybe yeah. more kids should be doing this and getting outside and foraging is an easy way to incentivize them to do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, in inoculating them with that appreciation for nature and with that understanding. Yeah as I said before, is going to yield a lot of benefits as they become adults and they become that next generation who has to think about real mm -hmm. issues of sustainability and environmentalism. Um, so that I think that story just illustrates a couple of points beautifully. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Let's get foraging in schools is the conclusion. <laughs> exactly. I think that's what we're pushing for is mm -hmm. a nationwide or international initiative to start making foraging in schools a thing. Foraging <laughs> class. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> oh, well, I'm starting with my little niece. I have a little two-year-old niece, uh, Lucy, and I. one of the first words that I taught her how to say was mushroom. Well done. And anyone <laughs> on Instagram can see the video where she's saying like mushroom and it's the cutest thing ever. And so, yeah, I, I am starting her on that journey and I hope to take her foraging. And I know a lot of parents who do take their kids out foraging have seen great benefit. Uh, yeah. And I, I, yeah, I think it's something that should be an important part of the toolkit nowadays. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So as we've kind of covered a lot, I know I constantly kind of refer back to just an appreciation for nature in general. Mm. You know, for you, do you have like a spiritual practice or like me and like others, is your spiritual practice kind of getting out into nature or, or is there some other practice that you do regularly? So I do quite a lot of yoga and meditation. Um, as well as foraging, which I also consider a meditation in its own right. Um, so for me, I think it's really important to have some stillness and some, um, you know, just quiet from the constant internal chatter. Um, and I think any practice that kind of gives you that space and gives you that quiet is so amazingly beneficial and just enables you to be more focused and creative and more productive in the time that you are you know admitting yourself to the real world <laughs> but as much of it you can have as possible is is a great thing i i that's that's awesome and i was curious about that uh because i think for a lot of people who mushroom forage it is like that i, I mm. kind of teed it up and but yeah for me it is a spiritual experience you know mm -hmm. i think that in modern times there aren't a lot of religious institutions or a lot of institutions that are really trying to that really do meet our spiritual needs as people i think mm -hmm. now it's become something that kind of everyone's aware of i think you're even seeing like huge mainstream parts of society turn toward a more spiritual bent and mm -hmm. i kind of see an underlying appreciation of nature as really the undercurrent of spirituality like even when you're talking about being still and i've actually taken your lead a little bit i started doing little like 10 minute meditations in the morning which okay. has been great the uh, best way to start the day is not the blue screen of the phone but some meditation Definitely. Um, but i think like even when you're talking about meditation getting into that stillness it's almost at a being one with the background hum of nature the background rhythm mm. of the consciousness that's all over the planet and so mm. You know, I think that foraging and 
can be so much more and mushrooms can be so much more not even psychedelics or psychoactives but just a connection with the outdoors and with mushrooms is like this amazing organism with so many properties mm -hmm. so many unique as kind of like the neural network of the forest and appreciation for this thing can be its own spiritual experience not that you need to see mycelium as like god but just <laughs> just that you are tapping into what are century or millennia old traditions of really celebrating nature kind of a materialistic spirituality where yes nature is the divine um, it is that connection we're all speaking when we talk about spiritual or religious practice. And mm -hmm. I tee all this up, not just to sound clever, but because I do want to talk about um, some of the folklore and tales from England. Not mm -hmm. that you, you're necessarily a pagan. I did see you on a post, you know, reference being a green witch. So I want to try to transition to that world of, you know, kind of the, the world of spirituality maybe even pagan spirituality and nature worship and kind of how, if, if at all that you've integrated with that world, because I think a lot of people in America, at least who have an appreciation for mushrooms or have an appreciation for plants are very aware of that world and dabble, dabble in those waters. Even mm -hmm. if we're not doing formalized spiritual practices, ritualized practices to kind mm -hmm. of, um, um, worship nature as it were. So I wondered if you had any experience in that world, or just an interest in that world or kind of how that overlaps with your passion for the outdoors? Yeah, so I think firstly, I just feel super lucky to be in England. Like we do just have such a wealth of like folklore and, you know, mysticism around around nature. I have this amazing book called Law of the Land and it's literally like a map of England with um folk tales from the different specific areas of England sort of picked out and um, a lot of it includes um you know like huge natural landscapes or uh, maybe a specific types of plants that grow in that area um so there is like a real wealth to sort of dip into oh I want this book you said it was lore, <laughs> lore of the land l-o-r-e of the land yeah ah, it's great terrific. It's, it's massive but it's really good and I'd say um, well, I lent it to a friend recently. She came from Canada to travel England and she was going to be here for eight months and she was doing a real kind of like nature trail. So I gave her the book because one of my favorite things to do when I'm traveling is have a kind of uh, almost like, you know, like an atlas of folklore and go to these places and read the old folk tales that were, you know, local to that area. What a good um, idea. It's lovely. It's a lovely thing to do. We did it in, in Scotland last year and uh, all the different like locks have different tales or different monsters that live in the locks. So you can go to each one and, and bring a little diary to write down all the folklore around those areas. There's a whole family of them. Yeah, yeah. A whole family <laughs> of Loch Ness monsters. Well, yeah. it's something that I was super intrigued with as well from a young age uh, was mm. the idea of folklore, the idea. And uh, I definitely think that part of those tales are really illustrating certain aspects of nature or personifying certain aspects of nature that help give us kind of a more tangible relationship. And mm -hmm. so I think that, you know, there is so much value to exploring those stories. Mm -hmm. And I love your idea of actually going to the places mentioned and reading these stories and really getting like this in-depth experience because who knows you know what kind of knowledge that's kind of unlocking especially if you have that um like a lot of us do in in america and obviously do there in england if you have that kind of uh anglican culture or background kind of in your mm -hmm. blood like who knows what those stories are unlocking for you on a subconscious yeah. level you know you're tapping into and not to get like to Jungian or Freudian, or, you know, but but unlocking mm. some of those uh, underlying cultural archetypes, I think it's really yeah. interesting to think about. And like I said before, it, uh, also having that benefit of tapping you into that undercurrent of an appreciation for nature, even if it's not so formalized as, you know, Druids putting hoods on necessarily. I'm sure that happens mm. too, but even if it's not so formalized <laughs> as that, reading stories that kind of allude to that relationship can help us tap into that underlying spirituality. Yeah. Well, I guess all of the folklore was sort of written as, you know, either a warning or a celebration or a, a, a rite of passage for whoever would be reading it at the time. You know, it's, it, they were lessons that they told their children. And I think so many of those lessons have been lost 
um obviously we had you know like a huge portion of our history was lost especially like with herbal medicine and and folk tale and everything like that with with the witch burnings um so the folklore that kind of is left and that you can trace to a certain like geological location it it is incredible it's like you're you're relearning those tales you're relearning those stories and as we are reconnecting with nature and and being outside more and more those lessons kind of become important again and while it's always great to you know we're all about like progression and developing as a community but it's also incredible to have these lessons that have stood the test of time and that you know come from such an ancient place and really speak to you as not just a human that lives in this point in history but just as a human i think that's a great point and i love actually thinking of folk tales in that way as kind of vestiges as a t of a time where there was more intimate relationship with nature where there was more knowledge mm -hmm. of mushrooms and herbal plants that was you know it was actively suppressed and yeah, yeah. You know, while I, I'm not, you know, a Luddite, obviously we're talking over technology, <laughs> you know, but I think yeah. it is important to recognize that in a lot of ways, both uh, morally and spiritually, and there are other elements where you do kind of reach back to ancient technologies that were really effective mm. and you can bring them forward and blend them with mm. the modern day. Um, yeah. So I think uh, it sounds like folk tales have been kind of an important intermediary between like now where everything's accessible and you can go back and learn about, yeah, this knowledge was suppressed and really yeah. dig back and see that. Whereas in the interstitial period before that was possible, it may have been that all you had was a folk tale to kind of keep that spark alive yeah. until it could be passed to a generation that could really ignite it again and go back and retrieve all that knowledge. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So outside of just being fun stories that I love, I am now <laughs> ascribing like a monumental in intergenerational importance to them that I don't think <laughs> that I don't think's far off. I mean, I think what you're saying there it, that just brought that thought to my mind, but I don't think that's mm. far off, and mm. um, it, it's just hugely intriguing to me. Mm, yeah, I think they they are incredibly important, and and also just you know they're beautiful. They're they're little pieces of artwork that get passed down and you know no one ever remembers a folk tale like perfectly you add a little bit you take a little bit away you mix it up so it's almost like every time and and also every time you get told a folk tale in person you don't read it off the internet it, you know it, it literally is passed down to you it it's something so unique that probably only you have heard because whenever they've said it to someone else it's it had a little bit changed or a character went missing and someone else turned up so yeah they are kind of constantly developing little gifts and just to tie it back to mushroom foraging you know i think when you brought up oral tradition i think mushroom foraging is one of those things that is still kind of an oral tradition and there's something special to traditions like that now where everything mm -hmm. is seemingly like so known and well mapped out and widely available there is mm -hmm. something that we love about knowledge that isn't disseminated everywhere that, you know, only yeah. you and a select group are kind of <laughs> initiated into learning. Uh, so there is something really special about oral traditions, whether it be from folklore or whether it be, you know, from mushroom hunting. And, you know, that's something that I've experienced, you know, when I took a trip to Mexico this past year, uh, one of the, the natives there told me that this certain polypore that was growing on a tree, I wasn't exactly sure what it was. It was pretty high up in the tree, but one of those hard, you know, conch polypores. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, yeah, well, if you take that and get an extract from that and mix it with snake's blood, it's actually hugely invigorating. And I'm thinking like, what? I've never <laughs> heard of that before. Obviously, like that's not in the, the literature. That's not in my guidebook. And there was yeah. something so great. And like now I've this is like the millionth time I've told that story because it was so cool. Um, and there is something about those oral traditions that is so intriguing to us probably more so in a world where it feels like everything is known. And I think that's mm. a great pull that gets people into mushrooms is that there is still that bit of mystery. I mean, you get just enough knowledge where you can kind of step into this vast unknown. Yeah, You know, you get some of the terminology and someone who kind of shows you the door into this 
uh, mm -hmm. uh, other universe of kind of fungal networks and everything, but there's still so much left to explore. And I think, you know, as humans, we are explorers and it's nice to know there's territory yet to explore. Yeah, for sure. They're still like to start discovering new species. And I think people, you know, one of the kind of community groups that I have found really amazing and useful, there's a couple of like Facebook mushroom hunter groups. And I've had in the past, like a mushroom that I couldn't quite identify. And I've just posted a couple of pictures um, into this. And it's like there's expert mycologists just sat at their computer waiting to tell you what it is right and a story it about it sometimes and, yeah it's amazing but i mean i think you know there are there are mycologists still who aren't um you know they're not being paid to do this but their love for mycology and their love for mushrooms is, means they're finding new species all the time um yeah it is incredible I, I have to second that. I mean, I, I tell people like, yeah, learn in person, but I think mm. the resource we have of Facebook groups like that, mm. you know, and obviously they're regional. So like in Northern California, we have California mushroom hunters and Northern California mushroom hunters and all these different groups. And it does feel that way sometimes that some of these guys are so tapped in, you know, yeah, where it's yeah. like you post a mushroom, you think it's nondescript or, and they're like, boom, here's this, here's the Latin name for it. And it's yeah, like, that is yeah. really such a huge, huge resource that we're really uh, lucky to have and there are a couple names that come to my mind of people that it always seems like you post something they're bloop right away they've yeah. got something for you so that really you know as much it's as the, funny as oh go on you go i was gonna say as much as the oral tradition is great there is something nice about having like a huge connection to everything already known that you that you can reference you know yeah just in case you need like a backup <laughs> yeah, in case... if there's no like wise woman to tell you the stories of the unknown mushroom you have you can just go on facebook <laughs> yeah, in case you don't have a, a, a touch point for that ancient tribal knowledge, you, you may need Facebook. <laughs> Actually, I was just thinking about there's an interesting story told to me as we're talking about like nature and everything with mushrooms. That same Italian gentleman, uh, my mm. heart, my hardware store, kind of Italian sage of mushrooms. Um, <laughs> he told me that one of the things that his family has always been keyed into. And I'm curious mm. if you've ever heard of this with harvesting mushrooms is phases of the moon. Um, mm. He said that, I think it was, God, I'm going to butcher it and not relay the information, but basically a certain number of days after the new moon is when you go out. Like more so that, I, obviously there had to have been enough rain, but more so than like, did it just rain or has there been sun? He's like, wait until, you know, whatever, 10 days after the new moon and go out mm -hmm. if it's during the season and you'll find mushrooms. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard of what, what my auntie does sort of like lunar gardening and she's very into like only planting seeds in, you know, the first quarter or, uh, you know, only harvesting her vegetables oh, when wow. it's the full moon or something. Um, I haven't actually heard of it in terms of picking mushrooms, um, but I think, it yeah, maybe it's a huge thing or maybe it's, I think lots of families like have their own little family traditions, don't they? And they yeah. sort of assume that everyone knows what that is, but yeah, it could it could be a huge thing that I missed, or it could just be them. It could just be them. <laughs> That's a good thing to remember too. Sometimes the oral tradition is it's just them. Um, oh yeah, you have to take the oral tradition with a pinch of salt. <laughs> dis discernment. When it's folklore, it's fine because if a new character comes in, it really doesn't make a difference. But if it's like, which mushroom shall I eat, and when shall I pick them? <laughs> Yeah, we need that. We need to exercise a lot of discernment sometimes with the oral tradition. Yeah. <laughs> and and actually, as we're talking about folk tales, do you have uh, any particular folk tales that you love, or any ones that really stand out as something everyone should should know about? Um, I mean, mushroom wise, I love the Baba Yaga folk tales. Um, oh. so I'm I'm sure you've heard of her. She's I, the, I have Eastern yeah. European, correct, or something. Eastern in origin. European, yeah. I mean, they're so into their mushrooms. They they're gonna have the best mushroom folk tales. Of course, it's weird that the folk tales actually sort of reflect uh, the whole cultural um, uh, opinion or whatever of mushrooms. Like in England, all of our mushroom folk tales are super like oh you know a young maiden went out and 
got trapped in a fairy ring and danced and danced and danced until she danced on bloody stumps because you know they're all like super scary oh, and yeah they're, yeah they're bad they're they're like really dark and like really you know the fairy rings are where the fairies live and they're like mischievous and evil and if you get trapped you'll horrible things will happen so these aren't nice fairies the mushrooms couldn't lead oh, you to no. a universe of nice lovely fairies no they don't do that not in england in england we've been forever warned to stay away <laughs> from the mushroom rings because um yeah fairies aren't so nice <laughs> now the tale of the baba yaga what is that um oh, yeah what does that center around is she kind of the keeper of mushroom knowledge or so she's kind of like um your archetype of like the wise old woman like the crone kind of figure so she's depicted always surrounded by um amnitas or, or fly garrick mushrooms um and she she rides around in a huge pestilent mortar which uh indicates you know she would have been known as like a witch or a herbalist or a wise woman you know she she would use her pestilent mortar to grind down magical herbs and create spells and um, she lives in a huge house that is on chicken legs and it just runs away and creates havoc now and then. And the majority of her stories are about transition um, and change and, and growing up. So quite often she'll lure young children um, into the woods and set them challenges. Um, and she's neither kind of good nor bad as as many oh. fairy tales and folk tales go, um, just depending on which folk tale you read, she might kind of just be luring you into the woods to eat you, or she might be, you know, setting you up for a life-changing challenge. Um, and I think I love the stories because I feel like they're so reflective of of the challenges you and the journeys you take on when you kind of open yourself up to that world of being more connected to nature and you know metaphorically walking out into the woods um to find your own your own path so i think one of one of my favorite stories is have you heard of vasilisa vasilisa that doesn't ring a bell oh so it's kind of it's a very like old tale um to do with babiaga and like a young girl with a kind of horrible stepmother and horrible stepsisters gets lured into the woods and um, the Baba Yaga gives her all these really, really difficult challenges thinking that she can't do it um, and she has to like rely on her intuition and, and trust herself and uh, she ends up being given the gift of a flaming skull on a stick by the Baba Yaga and she takes it, which is kind of symbolic of the vision that you get, you know, the the clearer vision you get after taking such a a brave walk into the woods oh. and she brings the skull on a stick home to her family and um it burns them to death wow okay i Lovely thought she was getting I, I thought she was die. getting some insight <laughs> she was getting insight to navigate the forest and she was going to come back to her family illuminated and no she Burns the she mall burns them to death. But she was that is also true. Your your bit is also true. She does it does navigate her through the woods. But it navigates her to the destiny of burnt, <laughs> burnt horrible step. Well, that's a psychological thing, right? We all have to quote unquote kill our parents. We all have to overcome mm -hmm. the archetypal familial figures to really become exactly. our true selves. So many so maybe archetypes. I, I like that. <laughs> better i like our <laughs> psychological version better than actually burning the whole family i mean yeah the folk tales are always so metaphorical you know like they're yeah. super dramatic people are uh, almost i think just just because they're the kind of tales you that captivate people and they're the kind of tales that you're going to remember but behind sure. those really dramatic events are the more subtle metaphorical meanings that yeah the literal story in. the literal story might not be as intriguing you know the literal story of like she retained this vision and came back a new person that might not mm. get remembered as easily yeah. as you know carrying the <laughs> banner of the flaming skull but i think that's really interesting to tease out i love doing that with folk tales i mean mm. you know not to um what do i want to say not to antagonize anyone but even religious texts you know, mm -hmm. those to me are kind of like the most 
uh, uh, potent folk tales ever. That's why they've survived. Mm -hmm. And I think there are huge metaphorical messages in all of them. Um, yeah. And I think it is really interesting to kind of pull those threads out uh, and, and oh, see yeah. what the message is. And it lends more credence to, to my newly established theory, uh, or actually well-worn theory, that folk tales were time capsules of some of this knowledge. Then that's yeah. how you would pass it along, especially when it comes to knowledge of nature or knowledge of humans' mm -hmm. relationship with nature. So you pass along the capsules of these stories that, and, and for some time, maybe even had to be uh, so uh, metaphorical that you couldn't glean the message because, you know, authority, institutions, things like that may yeah. have not wanted you to have the actual message, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, herbal medicines. And you talked about the time of like the witches there. Mm -hmm. It feels like there's this whole body of knowledge that is more associated with the feminine that was yeah. repressed. You know, we are kind of in a male dominator society in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. I think there probably were stories that had some of that more kind of feminine, kind of witchy, for lack of a better term, knowledge oh, associated yeah. with it that had to be disguised if it was going to get passed on. Mm -hmm. There definitely is. And it's so lovely to read now because I know, like, you know, growing up as a young girl, so many of the stories we were told are, you know, there's a lovely young princess. She gets saved by a prince. There's a horrible old witch. Done. You know, again and again right. and again. And it does sink into your subconscious so to bring back these fairy tales where you've got these incredible powerful women who are you know old and crazy and love herbs and the woods it, it they're so you know beautiful and i think it's so important that those tales are retold because there there are so many messages of you know strong powerful female characters that that we need and that we've massively lost yeah I, I definitely think that's true uh you know my partner has long been into kind of more of those folk tales and she's really into literature talking about how the oral tradition was kind of a feminine tradition and there was a long time and not to get too deep into this and obviously mm -hmm. i may be missing some of the finer points here but the idea that a lot of the written tradition was mm -hmm. actually became the dominion of males and almost a tool of oppression uh there's a book called alphabet versus the goddess where mm -hmm. women weren't allowed to read and so mm -hmm. things became this written tradition that became kind of sacrosanct and the yeah. oral traditions were left to females and kind of repressed so mm -hmm. i think there is some history there and that's why it is really good to revive these oral yeah. folk tales especially the ones that do show women in either you know, a positive light or at least not a negative light and mm -hmm. maybe at least powerful and in a significant, important light, not yeah, at the yeah. effect of the story, but main drivers of the story and having mm. big effects. Um, I, I think that, you know, now more than ever, as kind of yeah. we come back into an era of female empowerment, mm -hmm. things like this should come more and more to light. Yeah, definitely. There's some really interesting things that you can see within the history of folktale as well, like quite a lot of folktale um, you you see sort of coming from a, a bygone era that has this very, you know, like strong female characters. And then as Christianity comes along, um, it almost warps these stories and changes the characters and changes the message of the story. So here and I, also in like Germanic countries as well, there's um, a tale of the elder mother and she's this, uh, strong goddess who lives in the elder tree and protects the rest of the forest um and in some areas you know it's it's tradition to tip your hat if you want to go and collect elder flowers or elderberries or elderwood and you know you ask the elder mother can i you know can i have this wood or these berries or whatever um because she's such a you know reproachful fierce figure um that has to be respected right. and then christianity comes in and they change the kind of essence of the elder tree um and there's like a poem in the bible i can't remember how it goes it's something like never strong and never a tree since that since the lord was nailed to thee or something so it was the elder wood was the the wood of the cross that jesus was nailed to was made of elderwood and since then it became cursed lovely uh, and it was yeah. yeah and it and the whole you know the whole essence of it changes it becomes masculine it becomes you know weak and 
never a tr tr uh, never a tree and always a shrub and you know there's so many little bits in history that you can almost see through the evolution of tales just around different plants or different areas that you can kind of track that female empowerment yeah. rise and fall well, and I know a lot of, you know, indigenous cultures, I, obviously I'm not the expert, but it seems like a lot of indigenous cultures uh, in South America and in North America mm. did venerate females. They were matriarchal cultures mm. and, you know, and obviously they had an appreciation for nature. So maybe one of the big themes I'm taking away from our conversation is that as we progress in our modern era, we're kind of coming back around mm. to some of the true um, ancient... Uh, what do I want to say? Ancient kind of spiritual knowing that cultures have long had, which mm. was the importance of the female energy, the importance of nature. Nature is really the thing we're celebrating when we do celebrate our connection, our oneness. You know, that's spirituality. Call it whatever you like. The goal, the the paths are many. The goal is one. Get connected any way you can. And mm. so maybe we're kind of realizing that some of the track we've been going down for the past maybe thousand or a couple thousand years it's kind of taken us away from that natural human baseline which is mm -hmm. to honor the matriarch you know, maybe honor the crone um mm -hmm. and honor the natural world and to tie it back in so cleanly maybe mushroom foraging can be one of the tools that Yay. we use <laughs> that we use to tie back into this culture because it does seem like to me folks are more in tune with the natural world i just know there's like this huge section of the foraging community that mm. is really aware of this information really knows this stuff so maybe yeah. it's a subconscious hack to kind of help us get back into the flow of this of this information um, mm. to benefit to benefit everyone well now that we've kind of covered the whole width and breadth of everything in the natural world yeah all the folklore in England. We went which, all over. We went all over and I love it. I love taking a windy <laughs> path and getting into some things that, you know, I may not have the best basis for, but talking with someone else, we bring up things, formulate new ideas. Maybe people will hear this, be able to contribute their own ideas, and we're all getting a better understanding of this thing. Um, <laughs> but we are coming up on an hour and I do not want to take up yes. all your time. It so, is the mushroom hour. It is the mushroom hour. It's not <laughs> hours. Um, so I guess what I want to circle back to is getting personal again with uh with fern what is kind of next on the plate for you is it kind of more forage groups are you doing anything with cooking classes because you post delicious stuff on social media <laughs> i'm waiting for like the wild kitchen cookbook of fern you know what's next <laughs> um so i think the next year for me is really about focusing on my community um so i run local foraging groups um so I'm going to yeah, be working on those really hard, trying to expand them and turn my town into a little foragers paradise. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, at some point, probably next year, um, I'd really like to expand on like my blog and maybe have a look at doing a book. I'd really love to do something that makes very accessible, like foraging recipes available. I think it's you know I mean I say I'd love to be able to cook like really complicated recipes but there are such simple right. beautiful dishes you can make and you can make with kids um and I'd, I'd really like to yeah be able to share that so walks and groups and books and more more pictures <laughs> it all sounds fantastic and I would love an approachable forage cookbook because I've got a few and, you know, I don't have Michelin stars. No, but I, I mean, I am kind of challenged when it comes to the kitchen. So having like really approachable staples that you can make with forage goods yeah, where yeah. the forest can become kind of more readily my grocery store, like you were saying mm -hmm. earlier, I think yeah. would be really, really cool. So I really hope that book comes out. Uh, now, for people that want to learn more, what is the best way to reach you or what's the best way to find you? Um, so foraged by fern is my tag um, and Instagram and Facebook is where I live on the internet. <laughs> Come good. and visit me. <laughs> Very good. Uh, any? Are you on TikTok? No, I'm just, I feel old. People keep being like, yeah, look at my TikTok. And I'm like, what? I don't know what that is. Are you I, on TikTok? <laughs> I've been asking people that. I am on TikTok now. TikTok okay. is a, kind of like a wild west of social media. It's incredibly frenetic. I don't know what's going on, but I do know <laughs> there are like 
kids in high school making super interesting videos with all these visual effects and music. And it's like, man, someone put a lot of time into this. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I've started now just in the past couple of days, I've started posting up some of my goofy videos on there. And I'm like, <laughs> man, I do not have the production value of these oh, kids. I don't know. Laser if I'm, I seriously, I need to <laughs> up my game, but it, 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 all that said, it is kind of mm -hmm. fun. And I think it is a lot less curated than Instagram and Facebook, which has its good points and also, mm -hmm. you know, kind of its downsides um, yeah. and that you get some content that's like who in their right mind would be, but Anyway, this is not an advertisement for TikTok. I was just curious. I was just curious because I felt like I'll give it a guy. I felt old too. I was like, "What is TikTok? What is going on?" Um, and it, it is kind of a a wild west, crazy place. Um, so that's great. So people can reach out to you on Instagram. They can reach out to you on Facebook. Uh, we've heard more about your future plans. So all I'm left to say is thank you so much for taking the time and being with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. It was a pleasure and I hope we can have more of these in the future and I am definitely going to be looking into all this great folklore you shared with us. Good. Sounds great. <laughs>